المتسابق الأول في هذا اللقاء إدريس نواز من أمريكا دعونا نتعرف سويا على المراحل التي قطعها في هذه المسابقة من خلال هذا التقرير Idris Nawaz was given a warm welcome by his classmates from the Islamic School of Irving after winning first place at the International Quran Competition in Qatar. Three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode, episode six. Already six episodes in, and today I have a really, really special guest. He's a good friend of mine. He's an amazing friend of mine. I've known him for years. He goes to the ICI Masjid. Um, if there's an event going on anytime in Dallas with the big sheikh or anyone famous, Idris is most likely going to be there. So the one and only Idris Nawaz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you, bro? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. Can you say wa alaikum as salam? Wa alaikum as salam. That was such a whack intro. Tika, let's start. Let's start it, bro. Who yeah, cares? Yeah. Actually, you're right. That was a whack intro. Bro. No, it's fine. It's part of It's part of the thing. All of this is going to go in. It's mm-hmm. fine. It's yeah. going to go in? Yeah, it's all in. Are you Keep sure? It yeah, it's sure? all organic. Bismillah. Bismillah. So anyway, so today I'm here with Idris. If you guys don't know who Idris is, Idris is a hafiz from ICI. He finished Hifz at a very young age. And he learned the maqamat, also known as the seven tone of recitation under his teacher, which is extremely hard to do. He then took those and he basically went and competed internationally and nationally and won so many Quran competitions. So to start off, who are you to the people who don't know you? I mean, uh, my name is Idris. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Idris, uh, Idris Nawaz. I'm, I just turned 20. Um, I've been, I was born in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. I came here when I was, I think, like seven, maybe seven and a half. I started my hives here at the age of like eight and a half, and then I finished when I was 10. And then from then on, I continued to study and went different places, met a lot of different people. Now I'm here, speaking so in front of you. one and a half years you finished hives, right? Yeah, one and a half years. So the reason I wanted to bring on Idris today was because Idris is very, very, very qualified when it comes to this type of stuff, Islamically, about the Quran, about knowledge, about hadiths, all those different things. I mean, we all know how beautifully you can recite. We all know how you memorize the maqamat and learn under your teacher. But what people don't know is that you've actually won so many Quran competitions internationally and nationally. You won the international Quran competition at Qatar at a very young age. You got first place. And I mean, you studied under so many institute, Mifta Institute, Michigan Institute. You went to Pakistan. But to start off the podcast, can you please explain your journey to becoming a Hafiz and how? I mean, like? okay. So when I was in Boston, um, yeah. we used to like every Friday night we had this one program um, by this one scholar. He would come, and my whole family would go to this one masjid. It was a small masjid. The masjids in Boston, like when I was like growing up, they were usually small. There was not like a really big masjid. The really the the biggest masjid in the Boston area in Massachusetts was. Um, ICB was Islamic Center in Burlington But there was this one masjid in a city called Lowell mm. And every Friday My family used to go there And um, we used to sit and listen to the talk And there would be dinner afterwards I think the first time where I actually got like When my parents realized that you know what This son we're going to give him up for knowledge Is when I was I would be like the only kid Like at the age of like 4 or 5 Who would be like sitting on in, on my dad's lap And just listening to the talk Mm-hmm. You know, and all the kids would be running around all over the masjids outside. But I would be that one kid who was just focused on the imam. Mm. And the imam, he actually realized this one time. He's like, you know what? All of your children, you should look at this kid. You know, he's just sitting there and he's looking and he's like, he's fully focused, yeah. you know. And so my parents, that that's what they told me. They're like, okay, you know, this kid is a little different. We can use, mm. we should put him just for deen. Mm. And then after I was like, after that, I, w- I used to go to Sunday school at ICB, Islamic Center of Burlington, which was like the bigger masjid in that area where we lived. Mm. Mm. And um, I used to uh, I used to go to Sunday school, and I really loved hadith, which is something that I've loved until now. You know, I I, I loved hadith at that point of my life, and I remember there was this one um, book that we had to study about. Like we learned, I think 
a hundred hadiths yeah. okay a hundred yeah. hadith and then the time comes where we have our like islamic school graduation and my teacher was like you know what why don't you go ahead and go ahead and on the stage just mention to a hadith but then me because i loved hadith so much i i memorized the book from beginning to end so I, from hadith number one to a hundred, I said the whole thing off the top of my head really quick in like five, ten, like wow. in ten minutes. So, and then everyone was like, whoa. And then there was like this cute moment um, where I was like embarrassed and still to this day, I'm still embarrassed where I, was, I asked my dad, I was like, Ba, like what's the next hadith? Like I forgot. And then my dad tells me because he's looking, everybody else laughs. But like that was when um, my parents realized, because I was too young, like yeah. even at eight and a half, you don't know what the heck you're doing, yeah. you know? But my parents realized that, look, this kid we can use for knowledge. Hmm. You know, we should put him for the khidmat of deen and the service of deen. So it was kind of like that. Then my parents moved to Dallas just for this program, yeah. for Tanzil Academy to do my hifs. And that was kind of like, and me as a kid doesn't know what the heck is going on so then you just put me into a hip school mm. and um at, at like a young age I would have always been competitive so in Tanzil because of such a demand they have like this thing called hips pass where you have like 50 kids and then there's only eight slots available and you have to based on how much you memorize how much you retain and your akhlaq mm. you get you get chosen at the top eight so when I was there I was such like a competitive person and then you know my parents were pushing me and with everything so that's kind of, kind of like how I got into like hips so know? were you when you said um, for the sheikh in the beginning, right? Yeah. In the story, were you, was it because you liked it or was it because your parents sort of made you do it? No, no. My you parents did not. Like, my parents would tell me, yo, go play. Like, why are you so, because I've always been like kind of introverted, you know? I would love, I would rather be, really? I know I am very extroverted, what right? But this is something that I've had to build. In reality, if you gave me like a choice where, look, um, Idris, either you can be with a group of friends uh. or we'll like lock you up in a library for two months. Wallahi, I would choose a library. Like I have such a love for books. Really? Right? I love being by myself. Even as a kid, I would just, you would put me in a side yeah. and you would give me Legos and I would literally be quiet the whole time. Like I would not raise like any word. You know what wow. I mean? So it was something like in my own like interest that I loved. I always loved listening to le lectures and like hearing knowledge. And as a kid, I used to grasp a lot. You know, so it was never my parents. It was always my own intuition. What do you? What are your thoughts on people who sort of force? Because you had a love for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have a love for it because their parents forced them to do it, which mm -hmm. causes them to not like it. Let me tell you something. So we're, we'll talk about this later. But I went to a madrasa. I went to like a full time boarding school seminary. Yes. Um, which a lot of us in Irving know because there's a lot of kids who have either not graduated. I'm the first graduate of like the Dallas area. Actually, the second. Yeah, first, second, you can say. Wait, wait, um, wait hold on. First or? Wait, to graduate from ICI? To graduate from like the, the Dallas Tenz community from over there. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, I'm not talking about Tenzil. Okay, okay. But here's the thing I've realized. Even in HIV school, HIV school, you need the pushing from your parents, especially mm. when you're a kid. Mm. Right? You need that push. You cannot. There's no such thing as doing it on your own because mm. you're a kid, right? Mm. But when you get older and you want to like learn knowledge and stuff, I've realized in madrasa, people have come from like, there's kids there that are from every like walk of life. Yeah. Like their parents are either rich people or they're like in jail. Okay. Some of them don't have parents. Okay. Then they bring their kids here. The kids that are forced, kids that are forced, never make it through. Never, ever make it through. It's only the kids who ha at, at like some level want to do it themselves. Do you know what I mean? So for people like an advice for people who like are forced, rethink like your intentions. Every time like if you're put into a madrasa or you're put into an Islamic school and you're forced, like don't have the mindset that look, oh, I'm being forced, I'm being forced. Because every time you think you're being forced, our like us as our psychology is that when some people tell when someone tells us to do something, we're gonna do the opposite. Yeah. You know, like yeah. even as like human nature, men, that's human, human nature. Human nature, right? Like even like as well, we can't talk about marriage because we're not no. married yet. Yeah. But like even as a spouse, one of my friends just got married, his yeah. name Shaket. He's like, My wife, she used to tell me that they just got married. She's like, just because you tell me to do something, I'm not I gonna do the opposite. <laughs> like I don't want to do it anymore. So yeah. that's kind of like how it is. So when you Th keep on thinking oh i'm forced i'm forced i'm forced it's gonna ruin your head might as well look at what you're actually learning so don't look at what's behind you look at what's in front of you the book that you're reading the quran that you're memorizing and see how it actually like affects you in life and that will actually really help you change your intention mm. and for the people that like are being forced by their parents or like even for parents if parents watch this if your son is if you're like forcing your son you have to really look back and go back and try to help 
your son or daughter or motivate your son or daughter instead of forcing them to do something. Because when they realize that, look, I'm learning knowledge or I'm learning the Quran for my own self and not because my parents are making me do it, I swear it makes a huge difference. And they'll do much more too. It's not they'll like, do much more, yeah. It's not like, oh, I'm doing it because I'm scared of my parents. Exactly. I'm doing it because I genuinely... And that's for anything. Like if, if you force your son to play basketball, he's not going to do well compared to if he actually enjoys it. That exactly. goes for any sport in general. Exactly. But I wanted to talk to you about that because how would you sort of... um approach that with your kid if you when you do get one would you mm. sort of let's say he just doesn't have a passion for it because a lot of people are like that for example my brother when he finished hives you were talking to my dad about it i don't know if you remember yeah. mm-hmm. you said you go to this school that school and my dad was like i'm thinking of putting my brother in there yeah but when he asked my brother my brother just had no interest in it not because mm-hmm. he doesn't he doesn't want to study because it's just it's just not built for him with kind of you know what i'm saying yeah. with the intensity and the type mm-hmm. of studying you guys go through so my dad was like i'm not going to put him in mm-hmm. and i for me, when I saw that, I'm like, that's a good call from my dad because a lot of parents would have forced them in there and they would have just not turned out the way they would want them to turn mm-hmm. out. So how would you approach that to your kid if they don't like it if, in mm-hmm. that sense? Or how would you make them like it? Mm-hmm. It all starts from even before even start, even before yeah. birth. Like you have to put that, you have to change yourself first as a parent. We can't talk about like parents and for our kids because we don't have kids yet so if people like parents are looking at they're like who that like this is a kid like why is he talking but something that i would uh, so i'm not talking about as a parent i'm talking about as a child like how my parents kind of created the environment for me to go so we're talking about it from that uh, like perspective and that's something that i would want to do for my kids too my parents before i was even like born or when I was like just a child, they changed their lives. Like they were just like normal people. Then they went for Hajj and they changed themselves. The first thing is to change yourself, to change your spouse, to change your family. So that when your kid comes in, you create such an environment that you don't have to force him to do things. It's just part of the environment. So like my own teachers, Mufti Abdul Rahman, Mufti Abdul Habu Hid, their parents created such a mahul, we say in Urdu, like yeah. environment of knowledge and Islam that they kind of, they never had to force him. They already knew from the beginning that, look, I'm going like my, like, path is to seek knowledge yeah you know what i mean yeah so it's kind of like that building an environment first yeah. where you're taking you always take your kid to the masjid you're always taking your kid for lectures you're building his connection with scholars you know as a little kid my dad would take me to this scholar that scholar you know he's his kid make dua for him you know so i was always looking at scholars listening to scholars being in the relationship with scholars and yeah. companionship of scholars you know so building that environment first then you do everything you can to try to make your kid understand that seeking knowledge and Quran will save him in this life. Apart from, like, you see all of these different, like, isms we say. Mm. You know, like, you have these isms, those isms, like, all these fitna, all this fitna and fasad and LGBTQ and all of these mm. different things, right? So the only thing that can really anchor you into, like, deen is to study is to learn some form of Quran, is to be in the companionship of scholars. That's only, that's the only thing that's going to keep you steadfast on religion and kind of save you from that. Once you make your child realize that, then he chooses his own path. Now comes the thing where you've built the environment, you've kind of motivated him. Now your son doesn't like, his fitrat, his intuition, his disposition is like he doesn't want to study. It doesn't mean that you failed him. Instead of forcing your kid to go to Quran school, instead of forcing your kid to um, go for madrasa, what you should do is don't force him because then he's going to go the other route. Yeah. Instead, like just keep him connected to deen. And which I always tell this to parents and I'm not saying I'm not saying as a parent, but I'm saying as like a son, which mm. my parents have like put this on me, is that always be connected to the masjid. As yeah. long as you're connected to the masjid, yeah. you're fine, I swear. Well, I can relate to that too, especially with like VRIC because every time, like my whole childhood memories is just going to VRIC every mm-hmm. time there's an event over there and stuff yeah. like that. But what would you say to somebody that's 16, 17, 18, whose parents aren't really religious? How would you fix that? Because mm. there's a lot of kids, they're, they don't, their parents don't build an environment for them. Yeah. Their parents might not necessarily be religious, but how would you tell somebody? Or s- they might be religious and they're 16, 17 year old, they're just not into that. You know, so like we can't really talk much about this from the parents' perspective, mm. but we can talk about. I can talk about it from a scholar's perspective. Yeah. I'm not a scholar; I'm a student of knowledge. Yeah. But, and uh, we can talk about it from like 17, 16, 17 year olds themselves. Mm. Look, here's the thing: um, as a 16, 17 year old, we build some type of like we um, we build some sort of some sort of experience in life where we do realize at one point of our life we do realize that look. Um, my life of just like going around playing games, talking to women, um, doing zina, 
you know, all of these different things, this is not really going to forget like Islam and deen. This is not how I'm supposed to be as a person. So at the age of like 18, 19, you kind of build that like perspective within yourself. So as long, that's the thing, right? When you have that like paired with, like once you realize that the lifestyle that you're living is wrong, are you listening? I am. Once you realize that the lifestyle that you're listening is uh, that the lifestyle that you're living is wrong. Yeah. On top of that, you stay connected with the masjid, mm -hmm. and you stay connected with your imam and mm. a scholar. Mm. Then you're completely fine. Now, this is where us as like students of knowledge yeah. and scholars, this is where we have to step up our game. There's so many people. Who are, we know so many youth, like 18, 19, 16, 17 yeah. year olds that are comp like I know like this one dude. He goes to an Islamic school. He's like a he's like a kid. Dude is drinking alcohol. Yeah. Like out of everything, like you're drinking alcohol. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's our like people who have like like me. I have like I was born and raised in this community. Mm. You know, I was born and raised in America. I've been in this community. So me as a youth and a, a person who has learned knowledge, I can connect with these people more. Yeah. You know what Don't I mean? Don't you think it's a blessing for you too? Like Alhamdulillah, it's such a big blessing. Because you're born into it. Yeah, I was born into it. I've experienced I've had friends that have gone through it. I have friends who are who've literally become murtad, bro. Like who have literally yeah, I know a couple of people too. I know a couple you know? people too. Bro, it's so sad seeing it, bro. Class, bro, one one guy that's that's the thing. Even if you're in madrasa, even if you're in the most holiest place, it, well, you're not safe. If you think that just the environment will change me and I don't change myself, no. Allah la ma bi hatta ma bi anfusihim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to change you until you change yourself. Yeah. If you think that everything around me is going to change me, nothing works. Because one of my Adam classmates from my first year, he's a murtad now, bro. He left the fold of Islam. Right now he like he's getting back into it and stuff like that. Alhamdulillah, he became a Muslim. But like, there's a point in your life where you, ha you realize that like, look, th the only person that's gonna help me is myself. Mm. And when I take that connection from Allah and I work on myself, mm. that's really what's gonna change me. What if somebody doesn't have the support system like you? What if they're by themselves? What if it's a convert or what if it's someone who was born into a Christian household? I met some dude in here in Ramadan. He, I said salam to him and I'm like, I was talking to him and I'm like. So how long have you been going to Irving? He goes, oh, it's like my first week. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, he was our age. And then he goes, um, I just converted. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, you just converted? He goes, yeah. And I'm like, what the hell? How do you, like, how are you dealing with everything? And he goes, no, everything's going good. But he was like, I'm still kind of lost. I'm still trying to figure it out. So for people in that, how would you tell them to, like, fix that? You know, you know, here's the thing. Um, for a person who always wants to seek Allah, Allah will always allow him to find the way. Like, if you want it, you'll find it. Yeah. Okay? That so, goes for anything, by the that way. That goes for anything. Not just religion. Yeah, I swear. Like, it goes for, like, if you're broke. you and But if you, like, you're looking for ways, like, you actually make an effort yeah. to, like, like get money. Yeah. You'll get it. You'll find it eventually. Yeah, opportunities will always yeah. come. Same thing for your deen and for, like, what really counts, which mm. is your, your spirituality. Mm. If you want it, mm. you'll find it. Mm. How do you find it? The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً لنكا, mm. That a person who goes away from my remembrance mm. Lives a constricted life So we're, oh, we're talking about people who have no support system They're constricted They have nobody to go through mm. What I tell everyone And what helped me Wallah, wallah what really changed my life Even as a mother sister I was, I was bad But what really changed my life was Start doing dhikr Start remembering Allah Look at this a person, like when you start remembering Allah And not just, just repeating La ilaha illallah But mm. when you really realize that like Look, Allah is the one who created me Like you say like La ilaha illallah What does that really mean? That there's no God but Allah Who is Allah? The one who created me The one who created every single thing You ponder upon it yeah. And you create this like Like cognizance and this recognition for Allah Yeah Then Allah opens up the ways to you Because then You 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 like You tell Allah like Oh Allah, I recognize you mm. And I recognize that what I'm doing is wrong mm. And look, I'm constricted I have no support system Please find me the way. Mm. You know, help me go down this path of spirituality. Help me tread this path of spirituality. And then what happens is, you know what? A scholar will move into your area. Or... <laughs> really? I swear. Like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up the ways to you. Or wow. what will happen is, like, majority of these guys, you'll end up moving to Dallas. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everyone's moving here, bro. Yeah, I know. Because the, the environment. This is yeah. one of the biggest things I've realized in America. People want to change, but they don't know what to do. That's a big, big, big thing because there is this one TikToker. I'm not going to say his name. 
he I was seeing a video of him. He was one of those thirst trappers, posted videos, and then all of a sudden he just switched to making Islamic content randomly. And he made a video as to why he did it. And the first question he said was, he goes, when I first started, the one thing I didn't know was where to start. So that's the thing. Like, this is the biggest problem. People want to change, but they don't know where to start, mm. what to do. Mm. Like, what, like, where do I begin with? Islam is so vast, bro. Mm. Like, what do I start with? The first thing is, you start with the dhikr of Allah. Mm. Because you're trying to get out of that constricted lifestyle. And Allah, uh, Allah says that, فإن لنك. Like, whoever leaves my remembrance, he will live a constricted life. In Islam, we have the concept of mafhum mukhalif. So when Allah says something, like, bad, if something is bad, then what does that mean? The opposite is what? Good. It's good. So when Allah says, don't hang out with bad people, what is he trying to tell you? To hang out with good people. Okay. So when Allah says, when a person who goes away from the remembrance of Allah, he leaves a con he lives a constricted life, mm. then what is he trying to tell you? Live a good life. Wait. If you remember Allah, then what happens? Oh, oh that's what you... Exactly. Then you have a good so, life, yeah. Th then you have a good life. So the first thing you start is with the remembrance of Allah. I remember this one quote that I heard from this one scholar. Um, his name is Habib Umar bin Hafid. He's a really big scholar uh, in Tanim, Yemen. He said that if you don't know what to do and you want to live a better life, start with doing dhikr and more importantly, start with sending salutations upon the Prophet wasallam. So that's the first thing. Start doing dhikr, send salutations, sp perfect your spiritual life. Yeah. Start praying salah on time. Yeah. Okay. A, a big thing is if you're like a sister, start putting on the hijab. Start. Watch what you eat. What do you mean? Watch. Well, there's a whole different thing. It's it's crazy. Well, watch what you eat. Watch what you eat. In regards to eating halal, in regards to eating good. As in zabiha. No, we'll talk about that later. That's a whole... It's a whole different discussion that we can talk about. But okay. like, watch what you eat. When you realize there's a hadith, bro. There's a hadith. Yeah. Uh, he's raising his hands in the sky Everything that he has is haram He's eating haram He's drinking haram His clothes are from a haram source How do you think it's going to be accepted? So like Having a halal outcome Like uh, sorry a, a halal, hal, Yeah a Halal income Watching what you eat mm. This then, then you're showing You're basically doing what you can To show Allah that Oh Allah I live this bad lifestyle And I want to become good now and then when you do that, Allah will open up ways. Second thing, now you've done that, try to find a scholar that you can connect to. I swear it's the biggest thing. Try to find a mentor. The biggest thing we, we talk about, like this is the main problem, right? Mm. That we see amongst Muslim youth. They want to become better, but we don't know where to start. Mentorship. Who's Mentorship. your mentor? I mentor my own teachers. I have a teacher. I have a few. Mufti Ziyah, Mufti Asim. These are teachers that, that are just, they're crazy. Really? Yeah. But like you have to understand you only go to those crazy, crazy people when you are, I'm not saying I'm high, but I'm not at the lowest stage. Like yeah. I've improved to a sense. Yes. So my mentors are people who are at a high level so they can take me to a higher state. But for the youth, people like me who's like a sinner, like who's a dumb person, yeah. we can help. Right? Of course, we're sinners too. And we might be even doing the same problems that they're they're like they're in. Like, okay, for example, like a person listen to music and stuff like that. People like us, like students of knowledge, we're still like improving ourselves. We might be doing the same things, but we realize it's wrong and we're trying to help people so we can all become better. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. So mentorship, I swear. So that's where it becomes that person's problem who wants to change, he has to try to find a mentor. And us as students of knowledge and scholars. We have to offer mentorship programs. This is one of the things that I've realized, one of the problems and one, a of big the problem. one of the solutions that I've, I've realized is helping the youth is not just feel good talks. It's not just like having programs, creating organizations, creating madrasas. It's personal mentorship. Yeah. Going up to people, like really vibing with a person, going up to you. What are the problems? First, connecting with you. Right, then realizing that you and I are the same level, we're both youth that are just trying to make it out there, going to Allah. Then I just like, what are your problems? What are you going through? I can help you. And then you do that personal mentorship. Look, at the end of the day, us as students of knowledge and scholars, we won't be able to like help a huge generation of people at one yeah. time. But I swear to God, I swear by Allah, if we help like three, four, five people in our life like this properly, where they actually become better Muslims and you they feel help so people, content. forget content. It's you will get way more reward, and it's yeah. ten to a billion yeah. times more beneficial yeah. than it's like speaking us like a feel good talk to everyone, and then everyone like ten thousand people have like some emotion like oh my god I'm bad, and then two seconds later they go and they're like eating haram. You know what I mean? 
that's all that's all face value we're trying to get from the face value and we're trying to go from feel good talks to actual mentorship and progression mm. this is one of the other problems i've realized us as muslims especially in dallas mm. um we're used to like this feel good stuff yes yes i see that a lot and one of my friends made a joke about it he goes liberal a uh, bunch of like uh, yeah. li- liberal talks i don't know why he said that but it's he not was liberal to... feel good talks are important yeah like, they and are i know i'm gonna be giving feel t- uh, feel good talks once in a, once upon a time i think Look, they rely on that too much though yeah here's the thing feel good talks they fill in the gap of a certain demographic of muslims yes that are like who are co- living that constricted lifestyle yeah. and they need a boost to start getting yes. into the islamic yes. lifestyle 100 percent. but you cannot stop at those feel good talks. You can't stop at f- being like just feeling good, because that like you get some fire in your heart and it quickly it goes, goes away, away if like there's that. no what, yeah, if there's no progression. Well, I'm like this is something that I'm working on and mm. something that I'm trying to brainstorm when I come back to Dallas is trying to fill in the gap of progression. Us as Muslims over here in Dallas, as the youth, we don't have progression. We just have feel good talks. Okay, feel good talks. You listen to a couple feel good talks, then you feel that same emotional thing, mm. and then you go back to doing what you're doing back. Mm. You need to be able to make that little spark in your heart become a fire, and that is through progression. Making people like go through that like progressive. Um, ladder of spirituality where you just go from listening to feel good talks to actually bettering yourself to seeking knowledge to not becoming a scholar but knowing enough to better yourself than helping others yeah one person that doesn't do a feel good talk but when those lectures where they just speak about the reality instead of you know speaking about jannah 24 7 muhammad hablos does a beautiful job at that wallahi i swear to god if you listen to him bro amazing 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 job because he like you know people have his opinions on him with the way he yells and all that stuff but me personally wallahi i love it yeah. so many people get pit- my mother was like bro why do you listen to him he's like i put the lecture on once and she was going crazy she was like bro he yells too much it's not how you give dawah i'm like maybe it isn't i'm, I'm not an expert on how you give dawah or not but it hits the reality of life it hits the reality of life and he feels that like it's it's a progression that we yeah. need, you know. Yeah. And even I'll be honest with you, that's it's like it's still feel good, it's still feel good, but on a different yeah, level whole of different high, other whole different level. So you can go like full feel good, like oh yeah, you're doing great. Allah loves you. You can make sins. But just, you'll be punished if you don't do this. Yeah, this. Be <laughs> and then you go to him, and then you actually go to the actual progression, which is like start like actually bettering yourself, purifying your heart, going through that like module of of, of spirituality and life, and then you go through seeking knowledge. It's a whole progression. Yeah. That's what I'm working on. We don't have progression. We've stopped at feel good mm. because you know why? I'll be honest. Feel good gets you a lot of views. Feel good gets you likes. Feel good gets you more followers. Mm. Feel good gets you more of an audience. Progression doesn't because people just want to, you know, they just want to feel good, you know, but they don't want to progress Islamically, spiritually. You know what the sad part is? A lot of this feel good stuff, I see it on TikTok all the time, which is fine. But when I see lectures that like Muhammad Hablos gives or people where they give the reality, people don't like that. Yeah, I've seen don't. that a lot on TikTok. I don't understand. But at why. the same time, look, you have to. At the same time, you can't bring Hoblos into us. Like everybody fits in a different demographic. Yeah, His yeah, 100%. demographic of Australia, bro. Those guys are like straight. Like they're all affiliated with gangs. Like they yes, like yes. they. they <laughs> those guys kill people for a living. Yeah. So he's talking to them. So he's using a stern tone. Us as people in Dallas, like what, nobody's killing yeah, each other. Yeah, we're, we're not. We're not. People do hood. drugs and stuff, but we're not like it's. We don't have to speak to them in that like volume yes, and tone. Yes. So if we speak to them, like that's another thing. Us as scholars and. Uh, and students of knowledge we have to understand how were we able to disseminate knowledge from what we learned in madrasa from texts that are 800 years old into the muslim society nowadays i was dealing with a person who was homosexual he was gay now imagine i told him everything that i learned in madrasa oh no this haram i'm not gonna go in because yes you yes, know, yes yes i'm not gonna go into like the punishments that the, that uh, like the sahaba the prophet gave to people who are homosexual and like the hadith about it but if I if I tell him that, do you think it's gonna do him no. any good? No, you have to go with like connecting with him. Like you, every person is different, right? How I m- make every person better, helping myself obviously, but making every person better and helping him like get hidayah and guidance yeah. is different for every single person. That's what you have to realize. Like over now nowadays, if we use Muhammad Hubless type of thing and we just start scamming people, no, it's not gonna work. Yes, but if we you that mentorship, personally going to people and helping them. Yes. And what you get like a realize of, you realize like how they are as a person and using that to help them. You know the hadith, like you have to go down to people's levels. 
Okay, so if I'm if I'm if I, like us, if I go and try to like help an academic, yeah. I'm not gonna like speak to him in slang. No, like I'm gonna speak to him academically. Yeah. Now, if I'm like a pure academic, and then I'm going to like one of us, we're like we're just like chill. Mm. I'm not gonna be like the hypothesis of this uh, this dissemination of like we can't be like that. Mm. You have to you have to end it, you gotta vibe with. That's my main thing. Vibe with people. Okay, so that's how you're able to help people. So that progression cannot be done with Muhammad Hubble style yes. nowadays. Yeah. Obviously, there are people that you need to do that too. Yes. But there are pe more people that you need to be soft with them, help them throughout. Yes. And you may think that, oh, being soft with them is a feel good thing. No, that's not. It's just helping them progress. So there is this one when you were speaking about how you helped that guy. There is this one person I saw on TikTok where she basically converted to Islam. And this is one thing I hate about what people do, especially the converts. She converted to Islam. She had a dog in her house. She newly converted. She converted. She had a dog in her house. Everybody on TikTok starts attacking her. You can't have this. It's haram to have a dog. This. She ended up leaving Islam after. Because yeah. of the amount of... But it's that source of like... I And I agree with you. Like you, sh you need to talk to them in a proper way. But I see a lot of people, especially on social media, it pisses me off, bro. Like... It's so easy to comment something without actually knowing who the person is. You get what I'm saying? Because I see this so many times. Like, it will be a new convert. He'll have a tattoo in his body. They'll mm. be like, brother, that's haram. You know, that's haram. They're like, bro, chill out. He's just a convert. Yeah. So what do you think is the proper way? I know you just gave sort of the answer, but what would... Look, it, there's, there's two things. Number one, advising people with hikmah. Mm. Number two, looking at yourself. When you advise people with hikmah, you understand that people are different. Mm. A man is different from a woman. I am different from you. Right, um, our friends are different from us. So when you're able to advise people in a way where they will actually get it, that's what you're trying to do. Mm. These comments are not doing that. Okay, there is there is fault at both sides. Yes. First of all, a person who's like um, a person who is like a proper Muslim, he shouldn't be having things where there's like Travis Scott going on in the background. Yeah. Okay, so he's doing something wrong. Yeah. But now we're trying to help him. So now us as commenting, bro, what's wrong with you, you bad person, like you stupid idiot. Yeah. Like what's wrong with you? You're going to hell. Yeah. Like that's not doing anything either. Uh, either. First of all, you're not advising him properly second of all you're making him go further away from the deen yes understand so number one is having hikmah when you advise people and it's a huge concept in islam so when i see someone doing something wrong like my own friends are on tiktok do something wrong i'm not gonna go to the comments and be like hey you're doing this haram i rather i'll be like yo bro can we just go uh, can we have a talk can yeah. we sit down and then i'll be like okay you know this is something that you know you could do better Yes. You know, this is something that's not really according to Islam. Yes. I'm not going to be like, it's haram, you retard. Yeah, no. yeah. It's like, you know, this is something that's kind of haram. You should yeah. stop doing it. Yeah. You know, uh, when I saw what Faiz, I, I, there was a clip. Remember what Mufti Wasim told him? When he did the Allah, uh, Allah knows my intentions. Oh yeah, he thing. put it. I put on my Instagram. exactly, yeah, he exactly. About that, yeah. What did Mufti Wasim do? Did Mufti go in his no. comments and be like, "Hey, no. what you do is haram. It's haram. You can't no. do this. You know, you're playing with the religion." No, he went up to him and he's like, "Look, this is wrong." At the same time, look now I don't know that convert, but I'm trying to help her. Right. So when I I will probably like what I would do is I would either find a person that knows her personally and tell okay can you speak to this person mm. that's the best thing to do number two or I can I'm not gonna say slide into her DMs yeah which is like go up to her DM her and say sister look we're all trying to be better this yeah. is something that you can do better at the same time don't like bash her be like you know what you're a convert there's some things that you don't know we're all trying to improve don't think that i'm somebody good either but this is something that you can you can do better and not only will you get closer to allah doing this people will stop like abusing you because you're always going to find those type of people who are commenting yeah. that's number one advising with hikmah number two Wait, look at what does hikmah mean to people hikmah means wisdom wisdom wisdom. Okay. wisdom not just like taking whatever is from the quran and sunnah and just like throwing it yeah. at a person not understanding the context and anything yeah. Rather, it's just like understand what the person's going through, where he where he's coming from, and advising him um, accordingly. Hmm. That's number one. Number two, look at yourself, man. Look at yourself. That's big. Look at myself. The same people who are commenting. Oh yeah, sister, your hijab is too tight. You're showing your hair. Following you half naked them, woman. Yeah, bro. they're following. Yeah, they have like OnlyFans accounts. Like they're following people on OnlyFans. Look, when you're helping others. You also have to realize that look, I have to help myself. Yes. They're like people nowadays are the biggest judges of others without judging themselves. Like you have to realize that look, yeah. you're a sinner and you're trying to help people first. Yeah. Right? So when you're going to that person, before you go and help another person, look at yourself. Am I this like am I who I want to be? Like, am I doing the same thing? The same thing my dad tells me af after I became a scholar. You know, my parents are my biggest motivator. Or like my dad's like, always remind yourself, I have to practice what I preach. Every time I do a talk, 
my, it's like my, my dad tells me, mashallah, but are you going to practice what you preach? Okay. That's the biggest thing. Understand that you are a sinner and they are a sinner. And before you go ahead and tell somebody that they're wrong, look at yourself and be like, what can I fix about myself? Is that an expectation you have on yourself whenever you give a khutbah 100%. or something? And 100%. then you go, whether it's listening to music or whether it's whatever it is, and then you go, I, I might do that, I might have to stop. Or do you have that fear of, I don't want to become a hypocrite because I'm advising somebody, I'm giving a talk, mm. but yet I still might have a problem with it. So there's two extremes. There's one extreme of not being good yourself and just telling everybody that they're wrong and then you're a hypocrite. And there's number two where you feel like you're not doing something right and somebody else you see is not doing that same thing right. And you're like, look, I'm not doing, I'm doing it bad myself, so I'm not going to advise them. Mm. That's another extreme. That's actually another form of bad that we see ourselves as sinners and we see other people doing bad. And then we're like, look, I'm doing that sin myself. You know what? He's going to just tell me, hey, what are, aren't you doing this thing wrong? You know, so us as people, we have to constantly realize that we're trying to get better ourselves and helping other people is a way of us getting better. So when I tell people about like listening to me, I don't, alhamdulillah, I've stopped listening to music, but there's times where like, you know, like something you're tempted. Will drop. Yeah, yeah so I know, I know what you're talking about. I swear, about. there's some temptations with other people, like it's with girls and things like that. With all of us, like yeah. we're young guys. Yes. Right? Yes. We're not so meant to be perfect. We're, we're here to be. We're not meant to be perfect, but we're meant to always be progressing and improving. Yes. Understand? Yes, we cannot go backwards. So while you're progressing, you can help people and you help people with the intention not to help them but to help you so if you're listening to like travis scott and i advise you and i'm going to be like look bro i know how it is and i feel you on that and this is why i want to help you because i have done better myself and i'm going through the same problem and what i see within me i see within you so i want to help you and through that i'm trying to help myself so when you advise people and you're wrong like you're doing sins yourself yeah. you're like look man i'm helping you but i'm really trying to help myself and that's more powerful too. That's more powerful than a scholar who came from India, Pakistan. It was like, what haram, the hell is haram, wrong with haram. you? <laughs> exactly, bro. That's why it's such a blessing for us as people who are uh, at least closer to deen than others, even though we're sinners. Yeah. We can really vibe with people. We can tell people, look, bro, you're listening to music. I, I've listened to it before and I know how hard it is to stop and I know how available it is to people and how available it is to you. But here's some things that I did to stop and you can try to. And you know what? You might see me listening to music one day and that's why I'm in advising you so you can come and advise me back when you tell a person you advise a person like this i swear it will change they'll stuff 100 percent. 100 percent. what about to people who you do advise them and they go this is a very common phrase only allah can judge me how do you deal with that because the reason i'm asking this is i'm a related to social media a lot because a lot of people that watch this are on social media they'll do something they post it wallahi i see it so much they'll post it Someone will be like, listen, they'll advise them in the right way. They won't attack them and be like, look, you know, this is haram. Just, you know, try to post it down. Only Allah can judge me. Only Allah can do this. You know and they're what you like, tell them? What? you know what you tell them? What? If they say only Allah can judge me, tell them Allah will judge you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know I know. What I mean? But, but Allah... people have this false, like, no, false. People have this false ideology that, like, oh, only, only Allah can judge me. Nobody else can tell me what to do or what not to do, as in advise them. But I see uh, people misuse that so much, especially in this day and age, in this generation, not just in social media, but people in general, they use that all the time. So how would you, and the reason I'm saying that is because you said, um, uh, you brought up the, if you think you're not good enough, or you said something, I forgot what you, it was, what was it? You said, you were like, you were like, um, some people think they're uh, they're bad enough to not advise them, and some people think they're too good enough, so they go around advising people. So how do you how do you deal with people that specifically talk about the fact that only Allah can judge me, you can't judge me, I can do whatever I want with my life, I don't care what you say. At the end of the day, I have to be the one that gets questioned. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that that I've become I've, I've 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 been sent to become a mercy for mankind and then he also says in a, in a hadith that I have came to perfect the character of humans now if um so do you, did you see the people of the mushrikeen and that so I would tell those people that only Allah can judge me I'm be like look I'm not the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to help people Right? Mm. And so I'm trying to help you. Allah can only judge me and Allah can only judge you. But here's the thing. 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how he judges people, you are doing something where he will judge you, like he will he will give you punishment. So Allah subhanahu like the Prophet said that in Allah ila ajsamikum wala ila surikum wala ikin yandru ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at how you're shaped, Allah doesn't look at your bodies, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your taqwa and how what what good you're doing. So now you are clearly doing something that if you look at the Quran, you are going to get punishment for. So like and the brother is like putting music on his reels. Yeah. So I tell them, brother, you can't do that. So mm-hmm. then he's like, only Allah can judge me. I was like, bro, but what <laughs> you're doing is wrong. Like yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you a punishment. Yeah. You can't pull that thing that Allah, only Allah is going to judge me and then feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you. Yeah. No, you have to consciously make yourself better. Then you can pull that phrase that only Allah is trying to judge me. Yeah. So just the whole concept of only Allah can judge me is it's right. But it's wrong in the context of how people use it nowadays. Of like, only Allah can judge me so I can continue doing sin. They're spamming it literally for every small thing they yeah, do. They're for using every small it for thing. everything. And then, you know, a, a biggest thing that they'll, a bigger thing that they'll use is like, there's no compulsory in deen. You know, like Allah, like Allah's not going to force you to wear hijab. But then, <laughs> don't you realize that if you don't wear hijab, you don't put a constant effort to wear hijab, or you don't put a constant effort to change yourself, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to like ask you about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're if you're listening to music and you're like only Allah can judge me, yes, on the day of judgment, Allah's gonna ask you, why were you listening to the new Metro Boomin album when you can have listened to Quran and that had made you do this and this and what that? What are you gonna do then? You can't you bring up that then? excuse. Exactly, that. you cannot. But the problem is, is that people who have this ideology, me as a person, if I go and I tell them this like front on at face value that look what you're saying is wrong, you can't do that. Hmm. Same thing, advising with hikmah. Mm. You can't go up to people like, you can't use that phrase. It's not in the context, it's not a thing. You can't pick and choose religion. You can't just say, oh, Allah, only Allah can judge me and keep on doing sin. You can't be like that. You have to advise people like accordingly. So when can you judge somebody? Because I know that when you see somebody doing wrong, you should tell them and say that, look, like how you said, you shouldn't be doing this. But at the same time, there are times where somebody might be, there's that one hadith where, um, if, if it's a hadith, correct me, where um, was it... Uh, he said, if I saw alcohol in my brother's beard, I would assume that somebody spilled it on him or something. You know what I'm talking about, the one hadith. Basically he's saying that I would judge the best out of him. So there's a time where you should judge and there's a time where you shouldn't judge. Where is that gray area of when that that mix in between? You we get have what to I'm saying? understand first that there is a gray area between husnadhan and just assuming good about people and complete heedlessness. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And that becomes clear that gray area becomes like white or black whatever like it yeah. becomes clear when you understand context okay when you understand context i'll give you a context let's say i'm in my car mm-hmm. you see me listening to music what would you assume on that what would you what would so, be the like Islamic first way? i wouldn't like in regards to good assuming it means like what you view about that person so i'm not going to view you as a bad person maybe mm. there's something maybe someone is there that you can't like maybe your dad is there and he listens to like like this okay. indian music and you, and you try to tell him no and he's going to start like yeah. he's going to slap yeah. you but at the same time that's not going to stop me from kind of clarifying the matter to make sure that if you it was on your own and you were actually doing something wrong then i'm helping you because there is a hadith that come up about husnadhan, assuming good about people. And then there's a hadith that come up about you looking at somebody doing something wrong and you are not correcting it, then you're part of the problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when Allah, uh, the Prophet said that when you see something bad, try to correct it with your hand, if not by your tongue. And then he keeps on going. And then at least if not, then have like a pang in yeah. your head that look what, you're, what yeah. what's going on in society is wrong. So when you see a person doing something wrong, it's how you advise them. So now you're not going up to them and be like, look, what you did is wrong. First, you go up to and, and talk to them about content. So like if I see like a person who I think is a reaver and he's doing something wrong, I'm not going to be like, look, what you're doing is haram. I'm going to be like, look, why'd you do that? You know, is there something behind what you're doing? Did you not know that you can't have a dog in your house? Or is, are you forced because you're living as a Muslim yeah. in a non-Muslim household yeah. and they have dogs and you can't tell your parents that, look, I'm a Muslim, so mm. you can't have dogs. So you ask them about it. Yeah. At the same time, your husnadhan and your good assumption about people is not supposed to put you into heedlessness about them where you're not able to help them. Do you know what I mean? So it's all about generating context. Yeah. When you see how a person, that's why us as scholars, when like scholars, I'm like mufti, it's not me, like not you and I, but muftis, when they give like an answer to a fatwa, like when they give a fatwa, a ruling to people that are asking them questions, they will not answer a question if it's ambiguous. They will take full context first. Yeah. 
and then they'll give an answer accordingly. I've noticed so that. So that's yeah. what we have to do. When we see people, we can't just comment on their thing like, that's like, f that's stupid. Con commenting, oh, this is haram, haram, haram. No, you look at the context. What are they going through? You try to understand what's what's going on with the intention of helping them, not with the intention to like try to stalk them yeah. or something. And then you help them accordingly. I've seen um, with the heart softeners at VRIC, Sheikh Yasser, he does this thing where they you can ask questions to him. And he literally said in the mic, he goes, a lot of you guys are asking too many personal questions in which I can't answer within 10 minutes and I don't have the full context to. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing. Mm -hmm. You can't just do that. Mm -hmm. So like another example is, this kind of controversial, Andrew Tate, for example. I don't know your thoughts on him, but when he converted to Islam, I had a big debate with my friends. And the reason I wanted to ask you is, after he got out of jail or something, he converted, he, he was like giving da'wah about Islam, talking about it. But he had a video of him like smoking a cigar. And I said, my friends were like, ah, how could he do this? He just converted to Muslim Islam. I'm like, I said, look, listen, whether you hate the guy or not, he just converted. Now, if he's cigars, he's been smoking cigars forever. But it's not something easy that he can just stop by. And at the same time, I'm sure there's somebody behind the scenes that is trying to stop him from doing that or trying to advise him to not do that. But the point I'm trying to get to this is online on social media. Let me address that first. Address it. Smoking cigars is fine, but at one point when you know it's wrong, smoke it, but smoke it privately. Drink alcohol if you, no, no, I'm not saying drink alcohol, but if you have an addiction where like you can't stop, but yes. you're trying to get better, yes. why are you taking a video of it? At the same time, Andrew Tate, what I heard is like, it's all on his Twitter, right? There's somebody else who's posting it for him. He's not posting it himself. Yeah. But at the same time, like there's so many different avenues and uh, like as, uh, like perspectives to it. You could say that, oh yeah, there's someone who's like posting it. But at the same time, you can say, oh yeah, everything goes through him. So he's going to look at it and be like, oh yeah, post this. Yeah. At the same time, he's becoming a Muslim. And then another person would be like, okay, but he, he, he keeps on doing it. He mm. keeps on doing it. Mm. So why are we doing that? And it becomes a problem. That's why I tell people, look, we, we whether Andrew Tate is good or not, yes. I don't recommend people to listen to him. Okay. I don't. Do you know why? Nowadays, us as society, we perceive everything like through black and white. Our perspective of life is not multi multicolored. It's always black and white. It's either you hate him to a point where you just dislike him, you think he's out of the fold of Islam, yes. or you love him to a point where all the things that he's doing wrong, you think that it's completely fine, and you'll pull up another thing of like, oh, you know, he's still a good Muslim, and so he's just he's just learning about Islam yes. and all those different things. Even the algorithm on social media is black and white. If you even tell your or you talk to someone and your phone hears it, like you know how like yeah. you're talking about like, oh yeah, I want like um like a phone and then you'll see and phone then your ads. phone ads yeah. and stuff, yeah. So you just say that you like Andrew Tate and everything in your feed is just gonna be pro Andrew Tate without yeah. mentioning all the bad things about him. You hate Andrew Tate and every single thing that's gonna be on your feed is like against Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We have to understand that not everything is black and white and mm -hmm. we can always take good and bad from people. But the problem is, is that Americans and us as youth were so dumb. We're so black and white oriented that either you hate him and you like the the things that he said that you can take benefit from that are actually important. You're like, no, hell no. I'm not going to take from him. Yeah. And then, or you become so pro Andrew Tate that you start wearing a wife beater and then shaving your head and having the thing and wearing those sunglasses and everything that he says that is bad. And when he t mentions his tweet, worship me. Or when he's drinking alcohol, you're like, no. And then you start making excuses. Or worse than that, you start smoking cigars. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? How do you go away from becoming um, a black and white person to where you just knock people fully off like without taking any benefit from them or you just you're infatuated by them and then you go to a person where you'll be able to look at people and take good and leave the bad learning knowledge when you learn knowledge when you learn the foundations of Islam you know what is right and you know what is wrong. Mm. So now when Andrew Tate talks about like the matrix or something about like, uh, I don't know, something that he says, which is actually true. Like working out and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, working yeah. out. Don't vape. Yeah. Do, like that, that thing go of like, get money. stop vaping. Yeah, like, no, not even money. go get money. That's, no? that's a bad thing. Like, not a good, it's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. We'll talk about that. Okay. But like when he says, stop vaping, go do some push-ups. Like meaning like, get your life together. Yeah, and all get that. your life yeah, together. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Take benefit from that. But then when he talks about other things that are maybe bad about like yeah, women and yeah. stuff like that, then you leave it. The problem is that us will follow the bad stuff too. Yeah. Or we'll hate the stuff that yeah. he says too. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you have to understand that you can take good and you can leave the bad from every single person. Mm. And you have to learn knowledge and have a good foundation of Islam to do that. Mm. Or else, 
just stay away from the controversy. If you feel like you don't know uh, enough about Islam and you haven't studied from a scholar, not just reading online fatwas or like going and searching in books, how you seek knowledge is something that we could talk about. But when you realize, when you, if you don't have a good foundation of Islam, I recommend people don't listen to Andrew Tate. Don't whatsoever. Don't. Okay, so people like Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. The Andrew Tate is not the only. He's not the first Muslim convert on social media. Yeah, Kyrie Irving, for example, he's a basketball player and he converted. There's so many other celebra celebrities that have converted. But why do you think us kids, us Muslims, young people look up to people like them? Not just Andrew Tate, but people like that in general. For example, like. I'm gonna be honest with you right now. I like a lot of stuff that he says, but there's a lot of stuff which I totally disagree with, like the with the way he talks about women in some certain areas. But when he talks about like go get your life together, stop being a bum, stop being at home, be like, I agree with that. But like I think I agree with you what you said how people just stick to one. They're either pro Andrew Tate or they're against him hundred percent. They don't have that little gray area. But why do you think people look up to those sort of celebrity Muslims that just converted and they go up to them for like advice? And the reason I'm bringing that up is like. You can take, like, I could look up to LeBron James in basketball. I could look at how hard he worked. I could look at the way he plays. But do I look up to him outside of basketball? Do I look up to him the way he, I don't know, parties all the time, the way he drinks? All, like, so where do you, why do you think people look up to in that in that case? It's a lack of spirituality. And, like, first of all, us as, like, youth, we look up to those people because, number one, they connect with us more. Yeah. Andrew Tate, we've seen him addressing like a huge issue of where men of of like men and men becoming more feminine and women becoming masculine, all that type of stuff. So you have like, here's one thing I'll tell you this: this is a big qaida or like principle ruling that I've learned from my teachers, and I always see this happening in society. Extremism breeds extremism. What do you mean? When you have one extreme, it will always create another extreme. Okay. If you have full-on feminists that are telling you that you can, we cannot value men, we have to put them down and we don't need men, then what are you going to have? You're going to have these red pill society people that are telling you, oh yeah, we don't need women, trash them, you can use them, they're like objects. Do you understand? Yeah. So also, when you have people that are religious to a point where they start like rebuking everyone, mm. then you're going to have orientalists that are telling you that Islam is all about inclusivity and then you can do everything. That you want to do So if you have one extreme You're always going to go to another extreme The middle f Like ground is literally Sharia Sharia law When you realize that And when you study Sharia law And you realize how Islam is so fair to men and women Where men and women You realize that men and women Have different responsibilities But the same value Yes yeah, Okay Yeah Then Then you have a middle based understanding That's why when I tell people about Islam And we talk about Andrew Tate I'm like look from the views that I have, it's haq, it's truth. This is what I've learned from Sharia, Sharia law. So you can call me a feminist, or you can call me a misogynist, mm -hmm. or you can call me like a woman lover or a woman hater. You can call me like a masculine person, call me a feminine. Whatever perspective that puts me in, I'm telling you what Islam says. So if that makes me a feminist, go ahead, I'm a feminist. If that makes me misogynist, that's fine, make me misogynist, but I'm a Muslim first. And when you speak by Sharia law, you realize that everything is out of balance. That's the thing. Right now, going back to your question of uh, what were you celebrities, saying? Celebrities, like celebrity. Why Muslims. do we look at celebrities? Because they can vibe with us more, man. Like us as people, we've been, we've just been seeing like a lot of this like feminist thing. I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm not saying that yeah, they're good. There's yeah. good and bad to take yes. from everything. But you see like this extreme content of like of like people like women bashing us, and we're getting bashed, right? Yeah. So now you have this one hero that comes up named Andrew Tate, who like men, you guys have actually have some value within yourselves and in society. Yeah. Then what happens? You're gonna have men that obviously you're going to incline to him more. So it's 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 number one. It, it, work has to be done on on th all three values. The audience, us as youth, we have to realize that these people are just doing it right, but they're not people that we should look up to. Mm. We can take motivation, but we shouldn't go up to them for help. Number two, Andrew Tate should realize that look, that I am somebody that like majority of people like, follow. Yeah, people follow men and women nowadays, yeah. right? Yeah. So I have to. Get my stuff together. Yes. I have to really show them what Islam is about. Yes. I can't mess up. I can't like, I can't like show myself. Oh, of course, I'm a practicing Muslim, but when someone tells me something is wrong, which people have done, I can't keep on doing it on social media. I have to try to become better and better and better. Mm. And I have to try to learn. Everything goes back to knowledge. I have to try to learn ilm, try to learn knowledge. Then scholars like and students of knowledge like us, we have to understand how we can connect with people without compromising deen. How we can connect with each other without like tainting the religion of Islam. Yeah. 
right yeah. so when i go up to you and you're like you're listening to music be like hey bro i'm listening to music too like i just heard that like like i don't know like that nav like m- like album that just dropped out or something like that right i can't be like that i have to be able to vibe with you but not compromise religion mm. do you know what i mean mm. once we realize how to do that and it's a process and it, it varies from person to person then everything will become better people will respect um like these figures that are like khabib and these guys yeah right yes. but and at the same time they're not going to go to them for rulings but they'll look up to them for motivation and support then they'll come to, to they'll come to scholars for actual like fatawa and uh, personal opinions on how, and actually how to live a balanced lifestyle yeah they'll go to them for lifestyle like how should they live they'll go up to the scholars for that and then us as scholars will be able to help the youth by like vibing with them and connecting with them and andrew tate will know his place and he'll know like what like um like facet in society that he has to fill so don't you think that you said we can relate to celebrities more which i agree to but at the same time don't you think that um if i was to bring for example if i was to take a hundred kids from ici and valley ranch together and i was to bring some scholar all the way from egypt if i'm being honest a lot of them really won't care as much because why would you bring it from egypt that's what i mean think like that, why would you bring people from outside? i'm saying like if i was to get a scholar or I was to get a sheikh compared to if i was to bring like a Ky- Kyrie Irving who just became Muslim. Who do you think they'll listen to more? Obviously Kyrie, Kyrie Irving, Irving because they can relate to. So I'm saying, do you think there are any scholars or sheikhs that can have the same effect that these celebrities have, which we can connect to on the same level? I think I think this. I think we Omar have Sinan to use, is one, in my opinion. I know, Omar Sinan and I think Sheikh Abdul Rahman Murphy. Okay. He, he, he really kind of said, but here's the thing. We have to use these type of people who are like celebrities, like they're doing work that is not against Islam and they're very like, Islamic. My main thing for that is Khabib. Like I love Khabib Why, for that. Bro. Like the yeah. dude doesn't watch movies. The dude doesn't show his wife everywhere. Like he's not going around listening to music. He's not doing anything. I remember there was like a interview that he had with like a watching movies. It's like yes, don't watch too bro. many movies. It's gonna make your heart hard. Like you need people like that. Yes. And you need the scholars. So what we did in Miftah was something cool, where we used his popularity and publicity, and we used the scholars that were teaching to create a mix. When we realized, when celebrities realized that first of all we have to become more Islamic. Second of all, when we work with scholars, we can really change the Islamic youth and when scholars realize that like bro nobody's gonna listen to you when you're after Isha talk no. but you have to bring these celebrities first help them make them become good so people can look up to them and then do things where you guys can work together that will help the youth so that's what we did with the Khabib event in Miftah you know what I mean we brought on Khabib right we got his popularity so many people were there non-muslims were there we took his popularity we took his like traditional understanding of deen and we like really portrayed it. even the questions that we asked were not about like you know when you're gonna beat up conor mcgregor yeah. again of course that was a question but it was just like like habib was so happy when uh, when my teacher mufti Abdurrahman asked him who's your favorite sahabi like that's what we need from them no one's asked him that before too, no one's asked, he's like i love that question no one's asked me this before you know, and then he was like, I think it was like Abdul Rahman or Khalid bin Walid or something like that. So we need to understand how we can work together. Khalid bin Walid. Yeah, it was Khalid bin Walid. But we need to understand how we can work together, and we need to understand which celebrity to choose. So like, you can't bring Kyrie Irving, you can't bring like other people. Like you have to bring people that are, like I'm not. There's nothing bad about Kyrie Irving, yeah, but you have to bring someone who's very like firm onto the. The reason I'm smiling when you said all this is because I've talked to you about this. Habib is like. Outside of obviously the prophets and the sahaba, if I was to list like three people who I just genuinely want to meet in this world, outside of that, outside of number one is Khabib for me, bro. You know, I was about to get merch from Khabib. So I was in I was in Detroit and um, I'm very close to like everyone in Miftah because they're yeah. all my teachers yeah. and I'm close to like their editors and like the people yes. who work in the cameras and stuff like that. So I just saw like a box full of Habib merch. You sent me a video. Yeah, I sent you a video, right? <laughs> full of like shirts, all Habib signed, bo- like uh, boxing gloves, Habib signed. And I was supposed to take one, and I had like full permission to take, uh, but I just didn't find space in my bag. Bro, what? <laughs> yeah. You had the, what are you talking about? I was about, about to take like a full pristine Habib signed glove, like full on. Like I sell that for like fifteen hundred dollars on eBay, but like I was about to take it. Um, but the only thing is like I didn't have space in my bag. But I have one of the one of my friends who is the editor. His name's Rehan. Shout out to Rehan. He's a cool guy. He's the editor for Miftah. When he comes to Dallas for like, they do programs everywhere in Miftah. So when he comes, he's going to give oh, me a call. Wallah, if I ever like, you don't understand how much like, Khabib actually means. To, like, Wallah, we're we're planning serious, to bring Khabib bro. back. Miftah is planning to bring him back. You know, that was my birthday too, right? January 25th when you guys really? did it. I was, I was trying to come, but I couldn't. Wallah, like, I would probably cry if I met him, bro. I'm being dead serious, bro. Wallah, he's changed my life and like, 
he's the reason I got into like MMA and like defending myself and all that stuff. But he's like, you have to understand, like he's good, but he's not like he's not he's not he's not perfect. No one's perfect. Know, like 100%. you can debate like in MMA, like they're hitting the face, you can hit the face, yeah. and all that, those type of things. But he's the closest thing we can get. He is, but like he's just done so much for me without him even knowing about me. If that makes sense, you know what I'm he's saying? Done, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy that like I'm talking like. When I was talking to Omar Suleiman, he's friends with Khabib. Like, me just knowing the fact that he's friends with Khabib, I was like, what the hell? Like, I was so shocked. It just made me so happy. But how is, how is Khabib like? Khabib's cool. I, I never got to really personally sit with him because you have to understand, when Khabib comes, like, he first of all, he's super expensive. So, he's so expensive. Like, we're not going to get into it because of the podcast and stuff like that. I can't mention how much, yeah. like, Miftah paid for him to be on there and everyone, they had to fly out, his whole team, like, private jets, all that type of stuff. So, when you pay so much, obviously, like, you're gonna make sure that you're benefiting from him like every second of the way. So he doesn't like he's not stop just like or, yeah, 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 he doesn't stop or anything. Oh, he's constantly moving, doing something, right? So I only got like time to shake his hand, you know, stuff like that. Bro. But like just <laughs> just like him there was like, whoa. And like looking at his like disfigured ears, I was like, oh my god. Wallah, you don't understand, bro. Yeah, so but he's he's crazy. Like even like how he was speaking, how he was with my teachers. He spent because I most of what I know about him is from my own teachers who like he was at their house. Um, he held their kids and he talked to them. Like he spent like all, most of his day with them. Uh, my teachers are really blessed. Like they're they're so lucky to have met him. And he signed like all of their like the babies like shirts. And all, uh, it's it's so cool. But like he's just such a down to earth, genuine good person. Good person. He's just I don't know. His like sometimes you don't see this from scholars. Like akhlaq wise, like he's just very down to earth. He's very respectful. He's very humble. One of the biggest things that I try to take from his life is Humbleness. how he's able to live such an extravagant lifestyle where everyone knows him, everyone loves him, especially the Muslim population, and how he's just so humble. You know what I've realized? It's not more. It's 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 him, but it's more so his father. That's I was literally gonna say it's that. So Abdul Manap, bro. Wallahi, yeah, Abdul I was watching bro, documentaries like, on Wallahi, him. That's what I realized. Like. Parents are such a big asset to our productive, like us being productive in life and us being good in life. If you really have good parents, well, I say alhamdulillah. Like I swear, I say alhamdulillah all the time. I have amazing parents that help me go through everything and I make dua for them all the time. Like, look, Habib had such a good father. That's why he's maintained his principles in a industry where you literally, it's literally based off like alcohol and booze and gambling and everything. That's why I think people relate to him so much. Even exactly. me, because like, Omar Suleiman brought this topic up. He go, like he was talking about Khabib. He said Khabib's like that one kid in public school who sort of sits in the corner while everyone is in the dancing. They're doing that, but he's there in the. Cor but Abdul Manap, he didn't just impact Khabib. He impacted millions of people around him, millions of students around him. His millions whole of, yeah, everyone he trained, bro. Wallah, he like I take so much. Whether so it's it's or Omar Khabib's brother or it's Islam or a bunch of other people, like everybody just they. Everything after mentioning that oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to me, they all talk about his dad. Even Islam when he won. This is for Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov. Yeah. But like, he he's changed the way, like, my little brother Rayan, the way I, I take so much, like, he, if you guys have chance, not just you, but anyone watching, if you guys watch documentaries about him, he has a whole hour interview where he was talking about how he raised Khabib and stuff like that. I took so much inspiration in that because the way he trained Khabib at a young age, the way he brought him up, I saw that with like my younger brother, Rayan. Mm -hmm. And because I train him and stuff and like when it comes to wrestling and mixed really? martial arts. Yeah, he does, he, does, he does wrestling and stuff. And like I see the life lessons that Abdul Manap put in Khabib with the way I train Rayan. And like, well, I, it's so emotional when like I see that connection with between. That's why like I have such a big like connection with Habib even though I've never met the guy but he's changed like not me but so many people's life in many ways like one thing he was talking about Abdul Manap was every time Habib wins a fight Habib calls him up and then he goes yo I just won the fight like he's watching obviously and he goes my father never ever says anything good about me with the first thing first thing he says is the mistakes you should have done this you should have done that and then after that he goes okay can you like say something good about me now and then he goes yeah you did good but we have to come and work on some few stuff yeah that's why well i was so sad when he passed away it was just like there was a reel that i was watching i, I watch a lot of like ufc montages i watch i have everything memorized yeah, bro yeah I, I watch all these montages and it's just like khabib like just hugging his father and then he's at like one of these um what's the meetings that they have after what meeting? Press conference? Yeah, the press sorry. yeah press conferences, and he and they talk about like some random stuff, and then somebody asks him about his dad. He's like, "Yeah, let's talk about my dad. You yeah. guys don't know how much I love my dad. Yeah, was, this is my favorite subject." And then just cuts to him like winning, and his father's not there. Yeah, it's his like, father's not there. That's why he took it so like personally. Harshly. Yeah, 
Wallahi, you can't find people like that. Wallahi, it's, it's such a blessing to have a good father. We always talk about mothers. Because mothers obviously like yeah. they have more of a haq and more of a, like a right for us in Islam, but wallahi fathers are underrated. So underrated, wallah they're so. And people, um, the what's that one hadith where the where the person asked the prophet, so I said, "Who do I who love more? I love the most? Mother, like, mother, 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 and then, and then father. father." Yeah. A lot of people look at that hadith and they say, "Mother, mother." I'm like, yeah, but people underrate the father as well. It's yeah. a combination of both. Yeah. Mother is hundred percent important, but father is very important too. And one thing related to Abdul Manap, which I wanted to say was. He one, one interview They asked him They said Do you ever like you, We see it all the time Your son becomes a hafiz Oh mashallah You praise them so much They asked him Whenever Khabib wins a fight Do you ever praise him He goes Life lesson He said this As a parent Never praise your sons Or daughters When they're in front of you Praise them so much When they're not there But never praise them When they're in front of you You know what's crazy It's not just with my, my dad but it's with teachers as well, with their students. I've realized this even with my own muftis. When I would recite or I would get first in my exams or anything, in front of people, like, you know what? Whenever I used to recite, before I became a alim, right? When I was reciting, they would always be like, we're going to have a, we're gonna have a recitation from uh, one of our students. And they'll call me up. And obviously, I don't care about like recognition stuff, but it just hurts me, you know? It's kind of like, why didn't they even say my name? Or why yeah. didn't they even give me credit? Or even like, takbir, okay, now we're going to go on to this. But then when I talk to people who my teachers talked about about me, like they they're like they never had anything bad to say about. They always just like praise you, praise you, yeah. praise you, praise you. Same thing with my dad, right? Same thing with everyone. And I feel like that that's how you can be respected and not get that respect to like get into your get head. into your head, yeah, right? Yes, that's how it is. I swear. I think I'm a. I learned that too because I thought that if my kid, if they start doing well, you just start praising them hundred percent, but. Through, I'm telling you, like, through what Abdul Manap and, like, all the lessons I learned, if your son, no matter how good he does, don't overpraise him and don't praise him when he's there. And I, that's that's the reason why he's so humble. I mean, you see 100%. why Khabib's so humble? It's because his father never praised him. His father was always straight up with him. Yeah. His father was harsh on him, too, yeah. when at a young age. I But do you think that parents overpraise their kids a lot? Because I see that a lot. Nowadays, bro, I Again, see that a lot, bro. Yeah. And Again, how and and how yeah. much praise do you think is necessary for a kid to be, you know? Um, I would say, how much praise do you think is necessary for someone to give to their kid? Yeah, so we're not going to talk about it from the perspective of parents because we're not parents ourselves and yes. we can't give that advice. But we'll, I'll talk about it in the perspective of a son who received yes. praise from his parents. Yes. I realized how my dad did it was the best. Where he he would not like. Abdul Manaf, he would talk about like, oh, you did this mistake. Mm. But my parents, my dad would start off with praising me, but not in a way how you think, it. oh yeah, you did so good. Yes. And he was like, mashallah, it was good. I'm proud of you. He would yes. say, I'm proud yes. of you. He starts, yes. I'm proud of you. These are some things that you can done. You could have done. But overall, I liked it a lot. So you start off with praise, but not praise, but like, wow, you're the best. You you beat everyone. Just like, you start with like, I'm proud of you. You did good. You put your, you put like, like you, you know, you put a lot of effort into us and I really appreciate that. Mm. Then you tell them the mistakes. When you tell them the mistakes, you don't be like, you don't, this is another thing. Parents praise their kids too much. You always have to, it's always, I'll go back to like ex two extremes. Parents either praise their kid too much where they're, they, where they become oblivion to the, like to the fact that their kids are doing so many bad things. They're like, no, my son is amazing. Then you have parents who like their son will do something good and they'd be like, you did this bad, you did that bad, you know, like, it's like a thing with Asian parents and even Daisy's, yeah, it's like, yeah. why'd you get an A minus, you got an A plus, you should have done this, you should have done that, you're a failure, this, yeah. if you, there's always a balance to this, where you start off by saying, I'm proud of you, you did good, here are some things that you can do where it can be better for you, mm. but at the end of the day, I'm always proud of you, okay. that's the best thing I've done, like, that's the thing that my dad does to me, and it, it really gets to me, where I realize that, look, hey, I did good, I shouldn't undervalue what I did and the efforts that I put, but there's always something better I can do, so it allows me not to feel, like, bad about myself, you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel good, like, okay, I did good, but at the same time, uh, it gives me the realization that, look, everything that I did had, like, a fault, and I can always improve. So I'm happy and I'm improving. That's, as a parent, you want your son or daughter to do that. You, they, they're happy with what they did, but they still realize that they have to improve. So they don't become so happy that they're like, okay, I'm done now. And then, at the same time, they don't become so sad, they're like, oh, I'm, not, I'm done now. So you want them to be happy and them to improve. And how you do that, I'm proud of you. These are some things you can do, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll work them out or, 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 together. I'll help you, inshallah. We'll yeah. do it together, and then I'm proud of you, man. How do you prevent egoness in your kid, or egoness in general? 
myself let's talk about to, we're, we're talking about parents stuff we can't talk about that but within ourselves like how do i stop ego not, the biggest okay, thing not, is not kids like, okay siblings, like us as ourselves siblings, like as a person people in general yeah how do like us that how do we prevent yeah. arrogance in ourselves yeah. as a person i like to talk about this because i had the biggest ego problem i mean like what the bro, heck what are you talking about Bro, you? bro, listen, I become, I, I'm a half of, at the age of yeah. 10, I become like, I'm just, I'm not boasting obviously, yes, but I'm telling yes, you where I'm yeah, coming no, from. Bro. I, I won, I win an international competition where there's around like 5,000 people who could participate from all over the world. Yeah. Talking about Arab countries, Morocco, like Egypt, where like Qurra are like, like where they're born to be Qaris. Yeah. And then you have this kid from America winning. On top of that, you give him 30 grand when he's like 12. On top of that, like every scholar in the, uh, like in the Metroplex knows him. He, 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 he travels when he's at the age of 13 to lead Taraweeh. Like, you know how Shqadis go like one day, two days? I was doing that when I was 13. Then I go and I'm learning knowledge. I'm the apple of the eye in this whole entire community. Everyone knows who I am. I had like the e- like I had ego the size of an elephant, bro. And it's completely understandable how, like, how where I came from. And how to go away? People around me. What do you mean? I had so when this is why I think it's a blessing to, that I went to Michigan. Of yeah. course, like people are like, "Oh yeah, why don't you go to Chicago?" Michigan does your tarbiyah along with teaching you knowledge. When my teachers realized that I had an ego problem, they put me down to the dust in a respectful way. They didn't hit me, they didn't physically abuse me. Yeah, but they always like made me realize like how bad I am. Not in a bad way. Like we always think about Allah, like, yes. like just abuse you. Always oh, a madrasa where they like spank you. No, they did my tarbiyah. They did my islah. Like they yeah. rectified me in a way. Yeah. You know. And I had um, classmates who were older than me. Like, m- like one of my classmates. Like I don't thank him enough, but his name is Masood. Um, he's older. I think he's twenty four. He was uh, like he was. I looked up to him, and I don't tell him this up front because it's kind of weird. Like your bro, you tell him, but like he, I, I was this youngest kid in my class, and everyone was older than me. They were adult age, so I was like kind of like the younger brother from everyone. And it's not like younger brother where I get pampered, but more younger brother and like we're gonna take care of this kid. So they would always like you know they would always put me down. Hey, like, you know what, where you are. Every time I would recite, like, you did good, but you know what you are, right? You still, like, you didn't do your homework and Maradwan got mad at you yesterday. Like, that type of thing. Always keep me down, but respectfully, where I don't get, like, abused or anything like that. Yeah. Like, basically, older brother affection. Hmm. And I, I, I'm like, he's a Mulana now. Like, he graduated me, uh, graduated with me in Pakistan. Yeah. Mulana Masood. That's what he did. I just, uh, you just need to have people around you that are close friends that you can really trust that you know that every time you do something good, they'll be able to make you realize who you are without abusing you. How do you find that that friend group? A lot of people, they have people who boost their egos. They'll do something, they'll hey, be is like, it, time for it is time for Makar. Azan's happening right now. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll wrap this up real quick. How do you prevent, so, actually, look, we'll, here's we'll, the we'll main just thing. Stop right here then. No, 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 no. Well, happening. it's fine. Continue? Yeah, it's fine. Look, the biggest thing is working on yourself you know the ayah al tayyibat al khabithat al khabithin talks about like if you're a bad person then you're going to get married to a bad woman <laughs> and if you're a bad if you're a good guy then you're going to get married to a good girl obviously there's exceptions but we're going on like what's mainstream yeah. same thing with friends if you're a good person then you'll attract the right group of people and if you're not when if you realize that you have a bad friend cut them off it's hard for some people though it because is hard a for lot some of people. people they just they they have people who just boost their ego completely, bro. They can't tell you, them when you, it's you right, have when to it's realize wrong. like, is this person gonna help my dunya or my akhirah? Is this person like the best person, like the best um, friend is like when you see them, like either uh, either uh, like tara ilayhim, like yeah. like when you look at them, you remember Allah. Like yeah. you gotta find those people. If you don't find it, then you gotta look for it. And f- in order to look for them and you want to attract them to you, you just become a better person yourself. Okay, so let's say I have a bunch of bad friends. I cut them all off. Somebody, for example, like the one TikToker I said, he cuts them all off. He has nobody. Where does he start from there? Now we go back to what we talked about in the beginning. You start with the dhikr, you get connected with a scholar. No, 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 I'm saying Allah friends-wise, finding, finding, oh, the, friend wise? finding the right group the, of friends. When would you, you say off, masjid? Would you say... Yeah, so the biggest thing is if you if you have an MSA hmm. in your college, hmm. I, I love MSAs, even though like maybe people, people make question, fun of it and stuff like that, yeah. People fun of them. I think MSAs are what's really bringing colleges together, what keeps them afloat in regards to spirituality-wise. I think you should connect with your MSA. If you have any a youth group that you can connect to, connect with your youth group. And when people see... You don't make it apparent. You just don't go and start praying to Hajjid in front of everyone. Yeah, like a campfire. yeah. But like when you become like, you know, when a person, Hassan Basri was asked by a person, uh, why do we see that the people who pray to Hajjid have like a light emanating from their bodies? And then Hassan Basri said that, you know what, when they pray to Hajjid, they're in khalwa with Allah. They're alone with Allah. They're in seclusion with Allah. So Allah gives them nur and light from his own light. You know how beautiful that is? 
So now, when you better yourself as a person, yeah. people will see it within you. You'll just you'll be just become radiant, and you'll attract those people. I swear. You always have those, you know, in, in, in class, we always had those friend groups. You have, like, the more religious people. Then you have, like, the people yeah. who are just fooling around. And the people who are always looking at girls and stuff. So when you, like, when you become a better person, you, you'll, so you'll fit audit, in. You'll, you'll, you'll fit in somewhere. You'll fit in. You'll find a way, yeah. That's what it is. It's time for mug group. It is time for mug group. Last, like, words, me, last words that you would want to say before we wrap it up. Anything. One last quote, one, one lesson you learned from your mufti, one lesson you learned in life. One quote. I'm not trying to be, uh, yeah, here. I'm not trying to be a feel good person. We talked about feel good. But here's one thing that I'll tell you. Um, we talked about like how to be a better person. Mm. A lot of times people are like, they, the biggest thing about what we talked about as like the problems that we have in society is like, oh, what should I do? I'm trying to be better. Don't underestimate um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and Allah's forgiveness. If you really want to become a better person, you start yourself and don't be like, oh yeah. And don't let other people who are like your friends are like, oh yeah, you know, you used to do this. You used to text yeah. this girl. Oh yeah, you used, bro, I was just looking at you yesterday. You were at the club. And now you, you want to pray. And yeah, stuff now like you that. want to pray and stuff. You, um, when we understand not to be sensitive, don't be sensitive. Don't care about what people say. Care about what Allah says. If you're fine in Allah's eyes, then who cares, who cares about what people what think? People well, like, think. Allah says that, look, if I want to help you, even if the whole entire world were to come to stop you, nobody, nobody will be able to stop you. And if you, if I don't like you and everyone wants to help you, no one will be able to help you. Just allow Allah to recognize that, look, I'm trying to change. And Allah will open up the ways for you. I swear, sometimes we always have a like, oh yeah, there's th one thing tawakkul, like just relying on Allah. And there's one thing like, oh yeah, what am I going to do? How am I going to make these friends? How am I going to get uh, close to a scholar? What if I live in like Wisconsin, Idaho? I don't know who to go to. I swear Allah works in like ways that you can't imagine. Like that's how Allah works. Like that's how Allah is. Like that's how the universe is. Like we think too like logically. Wallahi, if you have yaqeen in Allah and you believe in Allah and you want to change, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up ways for you. That's all. Idris,